Our theme is identity, and when I first heard that word, I thought of the question, who am I? That's, that's a question we all struggle with at some point in our life. Whether it's, who am I in regards to this relationship? Who am I in regards to me and God? Who am I with other people? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some moments in my life where that question was answered for me through different things. When I was five, I was sitting in my living room and my mom was reading the morning devotion for me and all my brothers and sisters and she was reading about the crucifixion. And that was the first time that it dawned on me that I am a sinner. So it was one of the first moments in my life that a situation opened up my eyes to who I am. And because of that realization, a few minutes later, I got another who I am who am I statement, and that's, I am forgiven. So I realized early, I'm a sinner, I am forgiven. <clears throat> a few years later, I was 12 years old, and I had this favorite t-shirt of mine. It was so cute. It was light orange, and it had Junior the Asparagus on it. You guys know who that is from Veggie Tales? And it had the quote, little guys can do big things too. And I remember putting it on one day, and I walked into the mirror, and I was looking at it, I was like, why am I wearing this shirt? I stopped growing in seventh grade. I was this height in seventh grade. I was six feet tall wearing this shirt that said, little guys can do big things too. I was like, why am I wearing this? Am I wearing this as an encouragement to everybody else who can't be as tall as me? It's supposed to be for kids who are like, I'm little, but God is strong, you know? So that's the time where that situation opened up the realization, I am tall. So there's another answer to who, my, who I am and my identity. A few years later down the road, I was in high school. I was 16 and I was at a summer camp and I was talking about somebody and not in a very nice way. And unfortunately, this had become a pattern in my life. And in that moment, I had someone call me out on it. They were like, how dare you talk about that person like that? How dare you make that comment? God created them. They're made in the image of God and you are trashing that person. You're trashing God. And that situation opened up another who am I moment. I am mean. But that didn't last long, because a few minutes later, the Lord convicted me, and I had the I am forgiven statement again. A few years later down the road, I'm a sophomore in college here at Jessup, and I had just quit the basketball team. And I walked into my dorm, and Olivia was actually the first person I saw after this, and she asked me how everything was going and how it went. Like, did the talk with coach go okay? Are you doing all right? And the first words that came out of my mouth were, I am not an athlete. And that was a really weird identity moment for me. When you're something your whole life and then it's taken away from you because of a decision you made. So I want you to think about some moments in your life that have given you the opportunity to see a little bit about who you are. Some moments in your life where something happened and you're like, wow, I am a musician. When was that first time you picked up the guitar and you realized you wanted to play it and then you had the talent for it? Or you pick up a brush and you realize, I am an artist. We all have those moments. So I'm going to give you a second to think in your life about those moments that defined you. So we have this question, who am I? And Kevin DeYoung tweeted a couple days ago that the question, who am I, is not nearly so important as who is he. So the reason I told you a little bit about who I am, even though I just read that, about who I am really doesn't matter as much as who he is, is because the past does define us. What we did in the past shaped us into who we are today. Those moments, those bits of an awakening into your identity and who you are, how they shaped you, whether you liked it or not, whether it was good or bad, it really does matter, and those moments define you. So the past defines you, and the past can help us see into who God is, too. So we're going to go way back. We're going to go to Genesis. And we are going to look at Genesis 1. Verse 26. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Before I read this, the importance of the question, who is he, apart from who am I, is because who am I doesn't exist without him. We need to understand who God is 
and what he's done in our life and how he's made us into who we are before we can really understand who we are as people. C.S. Lewis said that God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because he's not there. There is no such thing. Oftentimes when we ask the who am I question, it's because we've reached a moment of confusion or of doubt, of unhappiness and of anxiety. We don't have that happiness and that peace. So let's look to God. So those verses say, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. All those things God also created. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So I don't know all of your stories. I don't know where you came from. I don't know what your background is. I don't know what came to mind when I asked you to, fit, when I asked you to think of those who am I moments. But I know that this truth applies to every single one of us. Who am I? I am created by God. Not only are we created by God in his image, it's really important to look at. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. There's the distinction there. There's the separation. Who you are as a male and female really helps define who you are as a human being. You cannot separate that from who you are. That is how God created you to be. Before I make this next point, I'm going to read to you from... A list of rules that has been a huge encouragement in my life as a Christian. They are written by Brownlow North, who, if you haven't heard of him, look him up. He, his story is great, and it's such an example of the redemptive power of God's grace in our lives. Um, and he wrote this, this list, and it says, Six Short Rules for Young Christians. And number six says, Never believe what you feel if it contradicts God's word. Ask yourself, can what I feel be true if God's word is true? And if both cannot be true, believe God and make your own heart the liar. And he bases those off of Romans 3, 4 and 1 John 5, 10 through 11. It's the importance of being created male and female. We live in a day and, a day and age of confusion. And this is really important to remember, that this has a purpose, male and female. And it's really hard because a lot of times we either don't like the male or female or we don't like the roles that go with male and female. And we want to argue with God about those. And we want to say, this isn't fair. I don't like this. But we have to remember that this is God's word. And this comes first, before what we feel. Because our feelings change and God's word does not. The truth remains. So we have... Why the male and female? Why is it important that it's not male and or female? Male and female. For women out there, God created you as a woman, and you should be proud to be a woman. And this is the same for a man. You should be proud to be the man that God made you. You shouldn't be doubting who you are. And if you have people telling you and confusing your role as a woman or your role as a man, then I would advise you to look to God's word for these things. Because... The world tells us women that we have to be one thing, and sometimes that contradicts what God's word says. I think we have enough women who are brash, and we have enough women who are hardened, and we have enough women in this world who, who use, they use we use manipulation as a way to get what we want. And we see that at the very beginning as well. And something I want to say is that we have enough women like that. What this world needs is we need women who are filled with love, who are filled with joy, who are filled with peace, who are filled with kindness, who are filled with gentleness, who are filled with goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And if any of those things rub you the wrong way, that's the fruit of the Spirit. We need women who are walking in the Spirit, who are listening to the voice of the Lord, who are willing to be like Mary when he says, hey, this is the plan I have out for you. And she said, I'm your servant. We need women like that. And for the men, I'm going to read this verse to you.
So men, what does it mean to be made in the image of God as a male? 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything with love. We need men of strength in the faith. We need men of the word. We don't need passive men. So we have this first truth. Who am I? I am created by God. And that applies to everyone. It doesn't matter if you believe in God or not, you are still defined, your identity is still placed in, you are created by God. And then we have this second question we have to answer. And in this question, you get options. Like this one, you didn't have a choice. You're created by God and you are created male or female. And the second, the second question I want us to look at tonight is not who am I, but whose am I? To whom do I belong? And this is really important to get because we do have an option in this area. And we have two options. You are a slave to sin or you're a slave to righteousness. And you get to choose. So, Romans 6, 16 through 18, it says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. And I love the word slaves that it's used in this passage, because it's not like it's an option. It's not like, oh, I can piece out of these two options. I'm not going to be a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. I'm going to tell myself what to do. I'm going to follow my own rules. Well, that's living in the flesh, which is being a slave to sin. And Romans 6 goes on to say in the last verse, the wages of sin is death. So if you are a slave to sin, you are a slave to death. And if you are a slave to righteousness, you're a slave to eternal life. So we have these two options. You can choose. Are you going to be a slave to sin? Or are you going to be a slave to righteousness? And we can think as Christians, if you're a believer in the room, well, of course I'm a slave to righteousness. I follow God. I know who he is. But then there's this other, this other passage where Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Just because you know who God is doesn't mean that you are living as a slave to righteousness. Because you still have those choices to make. The everyday choices when you wake up and you decide, am I going to live for Christ today or am I going to live for myself? Because a little bit about what I told you at the beginning, pieces of my life, how I was an athlete. I can say that I'm an athlete at a Christian school and so therefore I'm glorifying God, right? Wrong. That's not necessarily true. Just because you step out onto the court with your teammates or onto the soccer field or into your dorm room at a Christian school, it doesn't make you a believer. You haven't shaped your identity into that yet. So you can say, okay, God, I'm going to use my talents for you. I'm going to glorify you with the gifts that you've given me, but then not at one point along the process are you actually acknowledging him for the gifts he's given you or you're not consciously thinking, I am doing this to the glory of God. Just because he's given you a gift and you use it, doesn't mean you're glorifying him with that gift. And we have other things that we try to do to make ourselves look like we're slaves to righteousness. Like we say, I'm going to stay pure. I have this purity ring. So God, we're good there. I'm a slave to righteousness. Or we say, you know, I sing on a worship team, so I'm a slave to righteousness. I'm, doing, I'm giving away my time. I'm up here practicing. I'm a slave to righteousness. But at the end of our lives, when we stand before the throne of God, we can't hold up that purity ring and be like, look at this, God. I didn't kiss anyone until I got married. I was pure. If you, if you never surrendered your life 
to Christ, if you never believed in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confessed with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, then he's going to look at that and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. The righteous acts that you do do not bring you into an identity of Christ. The only thing that can do that is the blood of the cross that was shed for us. It's the grace of Christ. That's the only thing that can get us to truly be slaves of righteousness. So I know who I am. I know that I am created by God, and I know that I am his. I know that at the end of my life, other people might be able to point and say, hey, she was a liar. She was mean. She was addicted to porn. But I can stand before the throne with the blood of Christ that covers my sin and washes it away and say, I was a slave to righteousness because my identity was found in Christ, not in the good things that I did. So whose are you? Are you a slave to sin or are you a slave to righteousness? Because those things are going to shape who you are and that plays the biggest role in what your identity is. So the last question that goes into this, who am I, who is, what is my identity, is who is around you? And I have a video to show. Yeah. <laughs> Sandy! Teddy? What are you, what are you doing here? I, I, I thought you were going back to Australia. We had a change of plans. Okay. <laughs> well, that's cool, baby. I mean, you know how it is. Rocking and rolling and whatnot. Denny? <laughs> that's my name. Don't wear it out. What's the matter with you? <laughs> What's the matter with me, baby? What's the matter with you? <laughs> yeah. What happened to the Denny Zuko I met at the beach? Well, I do not know. I mean, maybe, uh... <laughs> maybe there's two of us, right? <laughs> Why, why, why don't you take out a missing persons ad? Uh, 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 try the yellow pages, I don't know. You're a fake and a phony, and I wish I'd never laid eyes on you. Whoa. Whoa. I wonder if she oh, carries silver right. bullets. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you can Whoa. stop it there. <laughs> I love the face he makes at the end when he realizes how awful he was being. Okay, so why, how does that apply to identity and how does that help us answer the question, who is around you? So if you noticed at the beginning of the video when he recognized Sandy, he was like, oh my gosh, you guys know the story of Greece, right? It's like, oh, we, we had a thing this summer, summer loving, like we were hanging out on the beach, we were cool, and then he gets back to school and he's with his friends, right? And you notice that before he changed, he looked back and he saw what they were doing. And he saw that what he was doing wasn't cool by pretending to know this girl, right? Who you are in your identity is, has a lot to do with who you choose to spend your time with. And you might not think it does. You might think that you are immune to the peer pressures of this world, but none of us are. We rely so much on the encouragement of brothers and sisters in Christ. So the verse that I have with this point is Proverbs 13, verse 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So who are your friends? Think about your group of friends. I know we all have like our close group of friends, and maybe they don't go here. They're probably, they might live back home. They might be the friends you grew up with. They might be the friends you went to high school with. But you have that really close group of friends, the friends that you call and tell first about anything. I got on, I go, I'm going on a date. <laughs> you know, those friends. Or the friends where when you're really struggling with something, you go to them first. You have those friends. And then you have your, your acquaintances, right? The people that you kind of see and you kind of know, but you don't really spend a whole lot of time with. And hopefully, in those circles, you have non-Christian friends. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Jessup bubble yet, but it's this weird idea that all of us here don't know anyone who's not a Christian. <laughs> and that we, we, like, I never really got the Jessup bubble thing. I don't think it's true. There are people here who don't believe 
and Jesus, like, we're walking in a mission field right now. You know, we pretend that it's not. So who, with your friends, have you ever noticed yourself do something like Danny in the video, where you start to act one way, and then you're with your friends, and you're like, oh, I can't do that. That's weird. And if, for an example, I'm going to give you this one, for us girls, where you're with your group of friends, and you all start to gossip, and you start to say something about someone. You know there's that one person who's like, oh, we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be talking badly about that person. And everyone's like, oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. And we justify our actions because the other Christians around us are doing it as well, right? So I have something for that. Another um, statement from Six Short Rules for Young Christians by Brownlow North. Never take your Christianity from Christians or argue that because such and such people do so and so, therefore you may. You are to ask yourself, how would Christ act in my place and strive to follow him? So the next time you're with that group of friends and you guys try and justify the little sins that you're all doing together as Christians, remember that you don't get to justify what's right and wrong based off of what other people are doing. That's not the standard that we're measured to. The standard we're measured to is the work that Christ did on the cross. And if you want to look him in the face and say, I'm going to choose that this sin is okay. This sin's okay. You died, you know what? You died for my sins. This, this, it's a little, it's, it's a little piece. No. We're set to the standard of grace in our lives. But that doesn't mean that we should abuse it. So I challenge you in your friendships and with the people that you hang out with, look around. Are you that friend? Are you the one that justifies sin for everybody else in your friend group? And if you don't have a group of friends who you can go to for prayer or for encouragement, who you can be vulnerable with, I pray that the Lord would reveal that group of friends to you because we all need it. We're part of the body of Christ. And part of your identity in Christ is that it's not just you. Once you become a Christian, it involves the whole body of believers, the whole church. So then we have, you have your group of non-Christian friends, right? And I know you've heard the term missionary dating, but there's also missionary friending, where we try and convince ourselves that our best friends can be non-Christians, because that's not really going to change our relationship with God either. I am not saying by any means to not have any friends that aren't Christians. But who are those people? Who are the wise people that you're walking with who you're going to become more like? And then we hear people say, okay, but Jesus ate with sinners, and Jesus ate with the prostitutes. Yeah, he did. But we shouldn't put, our place, put ourselves in the place of God and pretend that we're not affected by sin anymore. Your closest friends, the people you walk everyday life with, the people that are the first ones for you to call, those should be strong believers, strong people in the faith, prayer warrior friends, people who are going to uplift you and take you closer to Christ. And then you have your other friends. That's first, is who is around you. So take a look at, think in your life, who am I spending my time with? And see how it affects you. Because there have been a lot of times in my life where I've been to Danny and I've been trying to do one thing and I look back at the friends around me and I'm like, oh, you know, that's not cool with them. So I'm going to change my mind. I'm not going to be Christ-like in this situation. I am going to gossip. I am going to be mean to that person. And the reason this is so important with who is around you is because, like I mentioned earlier, Christianity is not just your faith. Your relationship with Christ is personal, but it also affects the rest of the church body. And I have um, a section from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together. We are members of a body. Not only when we choose to be, but in our whole existence. Every member serves the whole body, either to its health or to its destruction. 
This is no mere theory, it is a spiritual reality. And the Christian community has often experienced its effects with disturbing clarity, sometimes destructively and sometimes fortunately. Your actions affect the rest of the body. Who you're with, how you're growing in Christ, the, fr the fruit that's producing in your life, that affects the rest of the body of believers, either to the benefit or not. So don't think that when you're asking, who am I, you're just trying to figure out a personal question. Because if who am I lines up with whose am I, I'm Christ's, you're also a part of the body of Christ. It's not a singular thing. It's not a personal, this only affects me. So I know I don't know all of you personally. I don't know where you're coming from. I'm sorry if I didn't answer that question, who am I? And you're like, oh, I still don't know. But I hope I've given you some key points to be able to look back and know God first. When you're asking the question, who am I? Go to God first. Because he's your maker, he's your creator, and he's where you're going to get answers from. Second, when you're asking who am I, look at patterns in your life. Look at either patterns of sin or patterns of righteousness. And that'll tell you a lot about who you are. And then thirdly, when you're asking who am I, look at who's around you. Look at who your friend group is. Look at who you spend all of your time with. Because that's going to say a lot about who you are as well. I love this canvas. I love that it is Christ-centered and that you guys have the opportunity to live with other believers. So I want to pray for you guys right now that what I just shared, that you would be able to take it out of here and live it with the other Christians you get to live with and the other non-Christians you get to live with as well. That when you ask this question of who am I, you guys can point each other to God first. No, no, it's not so much about who, who I am, it's about who he is. Who he is as creator, who he is as savior. Because all the little things that define who you are with your identity, you're an athlete, you're a musician, you like to watch Netflix, those things, they say, they say a lot about you and they make up who you are. But the number one thing, if you didn't get, if you get anything from this, I hope that you get that the most important part of this is who you belong to. Are you a slave to sin or are you a slave to righteousness? Because I hope that if you have not given your life to the Lord yet, that if you're still holding on to what you have, to what little control you have in this crazy chaotic world, that you'd be able to release that into the hands of the, of the God who made it. So I pray that you guys would be able to seek God and that you would know where you stand before him. That at the end, all the other things around you, that's not what's going to please the Lord. It's, are you his? Are you a slave to righteousness? Or are you a slave to sin? Father, I pray for your will to be done. I thank you and I praise you for who you are and for how you work in, your, in our lives, Lord. I pray for this campus. I pray for the students walking through the halls into the classrooms, the ones who are still struggling with who am I? What is my purpose? What am I doing here? That you would reach out to them. God, give us soft hearts. Give us obedient hearts. Help us to follow your word. Help us to reach out to those around us and build the community of your church. Again, I thank you and I praise you for who you are. And I thank you for your children in this room, God. I ask that your name would be glorified in all that we do. In your name we pray. Amen.